and you look at the name on the door that you're about to walk into to do an interview and it's Tom Cruise or The Rock or Meryl Streep and you go, that's, that's a big one. This is awesome. This is Chris Van Vliet. There's no other way to say it. He has one of the coolest jobs there is. He's a four-time Emmy Award-winning TV host, entertainment reporter, and YouTuber based out of LA who gets paid to fly around the world, attend massive parties, and interview Hollywood A-listers. Do you think the substitute teacher would pronounce my name? You Chris. mean Chi Rice? That's not my name. Chi Rice! I'm especially good at expectorating. <laughs> What does that even mean? Chris Van Fleet's not only the, the, the most kind individual I've ever met, but he has far better abs than I do. Can you take off your shirt? Which one? All of them. All of it. Sure. <laughs> so I guess we're gonna swim with an alligator now. If you're willing to do the things that other people aren't willing to do, then you're gonna get the results that other people aren't going to get. I think it's pretty easy for our audience to understand what you do, you know, standing on the red carpet, speaking to celebrities and stars. I'm going to ask you a slightly different question here. Mm. What is it that you really do? Like people think you're a reporter, but what's your actual real job? A fascinating question, Mark. And I think that really at the heart of what I do is I ask a lot of questions. And I'm seeking out <laughs> okay, like cool. great so, stories. So, so I'll like, just ask questions. You'll ask questions. We'll that's right. We'll just, it'll be a questions. cycle of questions here. I, I think that, you know, it started off, I think it could be put into the box of broadcasting. And I started my broadcasting career in 2004 in radio, 2005 in television. That has shifted so much over the last decade or so. And I think that what we do now is we create content. And the type of content that I create really just happens from stories. And if I'm interviewing a celebrity or an actor, or comedian or entrepreneur, whoever it happens to be, everybody has an amazing story. So I want to get to the heart of someone's story and also the heart of like, how did they get to where they got to? Because I think too often, especially with social media, we just see the finished product, right? We just see Tom Brady with seven Super Bowl rings or Oprah with all the success that she's had. And we don't see the stumbles along the way to get there. And I think it's really important to find out like, where did you fail? And what did you learn from that? And how can we learn from that failure that you had? Hmm. But so, so this is so interesting to me because I totally love that approach. I mean, part of what we want to do is is get past the shiny stuff, right? Like like you said, the stumbles, the lessons, the learning, sure. the stuff that makes these superheroes in our everyday lives like real people. Uh, but most of the types of interviews, you, you do two types of interviews, if I'm not mistaken. You have your 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 reporting where you get to sit down with someone for like three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, and you you got you got to hope that you make the most of it. And then you have like your longer form stuff. Is is that the majority of what you do? I think so. And I think that you could also slide a different type of one in there. Like the red carpet interviews are generally even like less, you know, they're <laughs> sometimes one or two questions or sometimes in like these terrible scenarios where they're really, you know, packed or tight for time. It's like you're sticking a microphone in with five other people sticking a microphone in kind of like what you see, like in the locker room after a game, yeah, where, yeah. you know, they call them a media scrum. So I, I think that those so you're are in there three... like throwing elbows against the other reporters. No, no joke. No joke. Like the first time I covered the Oscars, you get there and they've, you know, it's not uncommon to have a spot that's like taped off for you on the red carpet. And they have like a placard there with like the call letters for your TV station at the Oscars. It's literally taped off and it was uh, 18 inches wide. And that was it. It was 18 inches, inches wide. And there was a riser behind that. And then your camera operator also had 18 inches to work with. And that was it. So hold on. I'm thinking about this now for, for our viewers. You can see me like, Okay, so I'm like, so you're basically all standing sideways. So that way you can just get the microphone in there. Is that, is that right? That's really, yeah, it's like, it's like one of these and like, they've got all the room because you're like on one side of the barrier. So the celebrities have all the room to walk wherever they want. You're kind of like squeezing it in and hoping you can get like your hand in the shot there. Oh, uh, yeah. So yeah, so I'd say it's like three different types of interviews and three really completely different approaches to those types of interviews. Like if you're only getting at one or two questions with somebody, I think you've really got to think about how you want to phrase those because I've said this for a long time, but I think the quality of your life is the quality of the questions you ask. Yeah. So if you want a better life, if you want better answers, start asking better questions and you can phrase the same type of question 
in several different ways and get like completely different responses. So I think it's really important in those situations to be like, all right, like pretty much word for word, here's how I want this question to go. Whereas when you have an hour to chat with someone, you could really expand on the topics and expand on the ideas. You don't have to be as precise. You know, you can ask one question that leads to another, that leads to another. And all of a sudden you're on a completely different path from where you might've even thought you were headed in the first place. That reminds me, I suck with names and this is something I got to get better at because I really am terrible at like quoting people because I never remember who says anything. But there's this story, let's say, and I don't know if it's Roosevelt or some kind of American president or what have you. Just say it's Lincoln. Everybody just attributes every (laughs) quote to Lincoln. I don't think it was, but but, but the idea is like, you know, if I need need to speak for five minutes, you have to give me a week. Mm. And if I have to speak for 10 minutes, you have to give me three days. If I have to speak for half an hour, you have to give me a day. If I can speak for two hours, I'm ready right now. Right, right. Yeah. (laughs) And so I I think what you're saying is right. Like the more um, precious... The, 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 if you only get 30 seconds with someone, how do, you, how do you make the most of it? How do you know if it's good or bad? How do you establish a rapport? How do you do any of that stuff? I remember we flew to Paris and it was the Mission Impossible Fallout red carpet. And Tom Cruise was at the top of my list after The Rock. Like The Rock was the one person because I grew up being a huge wrestling fan. The Rock was the one person I wanted to interview more than anybody. After that, it was Tom Cruise. And We got to fly over to Paris. We were on the red carpet, world premiere, the Eiffel Tower in the background. And as he's walking up, the publicist is like, you have one question. And I'm like, what? (laughs) We flew around the world. Hold on, hold on. Let me get get this straight. You, so so your company flies you there, puts you up in a hotel. So so you're spending what? Day of prep, day of travel. You're there to do it. You fly back. So you're coming like, I don't know, 50 hours of time or something, 40 hours of time for this and thousands of dollars. And you only get one question? Well, I should preface it by saying the movie studio pays for the travel because okay. they're basically saying like, we're going to let you see the movie early. We're going to give you access to this. Okay, cool. you know, so so the movie studio then instead of your television company, but, yes. but the movie studio puts all this money together. Yes. And, and yes. you show up at the red carpet with, I, I, I think I've seen the picture, like the Eiffel Tower in the background kind of thing. Yeah. And, and you're there in the suit and you're like, and you get one question, one question. And I'll never forget this. Like, so I talked to Tom Cruise about legacy and I actually don't tell anyone. I snuck a second question in there. And uh, which I think, you know, I, I was really happy about because it was one of the earlier interviews. I'm sure some of the people later on in the red carpet are like, how dare you ask two questions? You cut into my time, which may or may not have been the thing. But I remember there was another Chris, one of my friends that worked for a different television network. And it was like, hey, one question. And he's from Denver. And I think that there was some sort of story that Tom Cruise liked to go to Colorado and ski. And he was like, hey, Tom, how much do you like skiing in Colorado? Or do you like skiing in Colorado? And he looked at him, he's like, I love it there. And that was the end of it. (laughs) And he walked on and he was like, "Uh, uh, congrats on the movie. And that was the end of it. And I like learned a huge lesson from that, that like, Got one question, like try to make the most of that. Do you know if your friend from Colorado comes back and they're like, this is all you got? He made like a huge joke about it and like made this huge story around. Like, <laughs> so he, 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 he just makes it this huge three, four minute piece. He did. Right? Like, he, and I think he jokingly made it like, you know, I flew all the way around the world. And they said I could have one question with Tom Cruise. If you could have one question with Tom Cruise, what would that mean? Like he built, he built this whole thing up. So he ended up making like a, you know, a fun thing out of it. <laughs> oh, I love that so much. And, and so part of what I wondered when you, I mean, I don't think anyone grows up, and I mean this with all respect, no one grows up and says, I want to be an entertainment reporter. And so you went to school for communications, you've gotten into broadcasting, you have done a whole bunch of different things. So I'm not typecasting you at all, but, but I have to imagine for me, like my biggest problem is I don't really want to spend three or four or five minutes talking to someone, even a huge star. That, that hurts my career. <laughs> like, because if I could spend time connecting with these people and have footage of them and photos of them and all this stuff, that's cool. But I just, I, the thought of only spending a few minutes and knowing that I'm like one of like 80 interviews they have to do that day, um, knowing that, that I have to make, there's so much pressure to make the most of that time. Is that like a downside 
to your role or your job, or is it just something that as a professional you come to you come to understand, you come to play with, and then you kind of gamify to make it even better? I would say like two minutes with Denzel Washington, Oprah Winfrey, Meryl Streep, Morgan Freeman, George Clooney, Brad Pitt, whomever it might be, is way better than zero minutes with them. So I will certainly take that. <laughs> That's but a good way I to think, look at it. <laughs> you know, gr- growing up playing sports, I think I had like this competitive drive, like just kind of like bred into me. And I remember being on my first red carpet and I was covering the Toronto International Film Festival. And it was very much like what you described, like elbow to elbow, like trying to like get your you know, questions in there. And like, I think because I grew up playing, of course, growing up in Canada, playing hockey and baseball, I played so many sports. I think it was like, okay, I heard what the interview next to me was, I want to make mine better. And I think that actually was like a, a driving force. Like if we only have 60 seconds, 90 seconds with, whoever the person is in front of us, I want to make it the best of that. I want to make the best of that time. And I've had so many exchanges where, sure, it's only a handful of minutes, but there's been like real life lessons that I've taken out of those conversations or like real nuggets I've taken out of those conversations that I carry with me in my daily life. And I'll give you one like perfect, great example in my mind that immediately comes off the top of my head. I interviewed John Cena and I actually had 10 minutes with John Cena. This was a few years ago. And he said something during that interview that I'll never forget. I was talking about like, well, would you ever want to do this with your career? Or, you know, do you have regrets that you didn't do this? And he kept repeating this one phrase. It was control the controllable. Like you can't control anything that's going on around you. But what you can control is how you want to react to the things that are happening. And all you have control over is the things that you actually have control over. And sure, it was a you know, relatively quick interview. Oh, I will say when I went to wrap him up at like the 10 minute mark, I'm like, John, like, thank you so much for your time. He's like, he reached into his pocket. He's like, hold on a second. We still got more time. Keep going. And I was like, what? This is amazing. I can't believe it. You're giving me more time. This is amazing. <laughs> that, that's like the greatest gift in, in your industry, isn't it? Like, cause, because time is the commodity. And so for them to just say like, hey, let's go ahead and keep going. That means that they got to be intrigued or having fun, right? Well, look, I think time's the greatest commodity that all of us have because we have a finite amount of it every single day and week and month and year, right? But yes, when someone is like, I know we agreed to this chunk of the calendar, but I'm going to give you just a little bit more. You're like, wow, because that means I can get one more question, maybe two, maybe three more questions, which extends the length of, length of the interview you know, quite a bit. And then maybe you can learn even more from that. Hmm. So you mentioned two minutes with any number of the people you've connected with is better than no connection at all. So much of, um, I mean, when you're working across uh, an actor, a sports figure, maybe a politician, a singer, when you're connecting with these amazing people, they're, they're well-trained and they know why they're there and they know why you are there. So I imagine sure. there's some kind of like rules to the game, but you still need to <laughs> do your job better than everyone else. And you need to stand out, as you mentioned, being competitive. So how do you go about, like, what is your secret sauce? How do you go about making sure that that two minutes you have with them isn't just 120 seconds that quickly kind of zip by asking about how skiing in Colorado would be? <laughs> sure, the skiing was great, right? Skiing I used was great. Tr- Next. <laughs> I try to start from just a point of general curiosity. So like, Back to the Future is my favorite movie of all time. And I was so fortunate to be able to interview Robert Zemeckis, the director of Back to the Future. And like, we were talking about a different film, but I'm like, well, I've got to ask about Back to the Future. And like, if I'm curious about this, as a massive Back to the Future fan, other Back to the Future fans, I'm sure will be curious about it as well. So like, I think that that's kind of where it starts for me is like, what's the general curiosity that I have? Sometimes I'll Google it too, like, oh, he's never really addressed this or she's never really talked about this angle of it. So like, that's a, that's always a really interesting part of it. And if they have talked about it a thousand times and the answer is very obvious online, like I'll skip over that and try to find another question. I think the other part of it's trying to phrase it in a way where instead of it just being a generic answer, if you can phrase something in the way that like you can dig a little bit deeper and maybe just peel back one more layer from the onion that then what other people are getting I think that that's really valuable too. And I think I learned this pretty early on. The generic entertainment reporter question is often like, you know, if there's a big director, it's it's often, what was it like working with Steven Spielberg? 
Yeah. And the person will no, they'll be Steven, like, Steven's oh, great. Steven's oh, great. he's he's yeah. he's great. He's a master. And I mean, when you think about all of his films, it's so oh, good. yeah, right. I would try to take that one layer deeper. And I, I remember the first time I asked it, it was like, what did you learn from Steven Spielberg that you'll now take with you on the next set that you go on? And like, I feel like that then asks for a specific like story or a specific little nugget of knowledge. And oftentimes that little nugget of knowledge is something where it's like, oh my goodness. Well, I'm not a filmmaker. I'm not an actor, but that's a great piece of knowledge that I can take with me in my own life. What am I trying to ask here? Because the first thing that popped into my head is, okay, so you, you graduate and you, you get your job of reporting and you're probably not very good at it. Uh, and you get better and better and better. And as you go through your career, I guess you just learn through experience. But did anyone ever pull you aside and say like, hey, this is how you do this thing? Mm. I don't know if one specific person pulled me aside and said like, hey, here's how you ask a better question. But so I started my, I started as a news reporter. Checks TV in Peterborough, Ontario. And that was like, you ran the gamut of different stories. You did like three stories a day and they were all very often completely different types of stories. And most of the time you were just trying to get to the nuts and the bolts of like the who, where, when, why, how. And then- Yeah, so it would be like a car crashed through the front window of a Tim Hortons <laughs> or, or, uh, or school board trustees are giving away free apples, that kind of stuff. Very much like that, yeah. <laughs> And like the first story of the, or the first line of the news story was often like, this thing happened. The next line was often, it happened on the corner of this street and this street. And like, you would really honestly just check off the boxes of like who, what, when, why, and how. And as I started getting into entertainment reporting, I, you know, I was so fortunate to like try to follow in the footsteps of people before me that had done such incredible jobs, especially in Canada. Like, I grew up being so inspired by George Strombolopoulos and the way that he was able to craft conversations and like sometimes not even ask a question, but just lead a conversation in a certain way. I was just like, man, this guy's a master. So I would just try to watch a lot of the stuff that he would do and go, if I could just have 1% of that, man, I could be you know doing really well if I could just have 1% of the skill that he has. But I remember it was... Um, probably about three years into my career, I was hosting a show called Inside Jam on Sun TV in Toronto. And that's when we're like, I think about maybe six months into that job, we I was covering the red carpet of the Toronto International Film Festival for the first time. And my boss had done it like several years before he had produced it. And, you know, he kind of knew the ropes here. And he kind of laid the groundwork for like, I know you've interviewed a lot of celebrities before, but like, here's what I think would be really good. Maybe we could even get a theme of like, you ask this one type of question throughout the week. And I think that that started to make me think about it in a, in a really different way. And then I remember when I first moved to the US in 2010, I went to this one junket for a movie called Dinner for Schmucks. If you remember this, Dinner for that, Schmucks. That win. was the one where everybody has to invite uh, the biggest loser. And then yes. they invite Steve Carell plays a character. Or no, maybe it was a, uh, it was Steve Carell, yeah. It was a Steve Carell who had like yeah. little mice. Like he, yes. he, he dressed up little mice in fake. Wow, this is an in-depth, wow. <laughs> is... I do a lot of research on, you know, I'm joking. <laughs> there was a guy there who was like very well-dressed. He was about my age. And I was just immediately, I was struck by the fact that he, he seemed so professional. And I was there in like jeans and a t-shirt just because that's often what I wore to interviews. You know, when you start your entertainment career on MTV2 Canada, you're, you're just generally wearing jeans and t-shirts. just like, that's who you are. So immediately I was struck by that. And then I went and started watching some of his interviews and he was getting these like amazing moments. His name is Jake Hamilton. He's now one of my best friends, but he would go into every scenario and try to create a moment or try to ask the question in a completely different way than it had ever been asked before. And that really inspired me to like take things to the next level and start to think outside the box a little bit. So you mentioned moving. So so you grew up in, in Toronto. Uh, and I say it like an American, I know Toronto. You grew up in Toronto, uh, went to Vancouver, moved to the States to Ohio, moved to Florida, moved to California. Can you talk to me a bit about, I guess, maybe the sacrifice or the importance of being willing to kind of move with your career? Because that's something that I think we all bump up against. It's like we want, we 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 want the growth, 
We want yeah. the next level. We want the next market. We want the breakthroughs, but we kind of want it all to happen here at home around our friends and our family <laughs> without making yeah. any sacrifices. But you've relocated quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a bit. I think for me, it was just like wherever the job was, wherever the opportunity was, I was going to take it. And I had this opportunity, you know, very, very early on at Chex TV in Peterborough. And that was about an hour drive from where I was living at my parents' house in Pickering. And it was an hour drive without snow. So when my internship ended up turning into a job there, I remember there were days when it took two and a half hours to drive there because up the 115. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. Exactly. Up the 115. It was terrible. So I think for me, for, it was for just, everyone, for everyone listening, just so you guys know, because maybe you haven't established, we haven't established this publicly yet, but Chris and I are both the same age and we grew up pretty much in the same town. <laughs> so that's why we have all these inside references where if you're not from where we're from, you have no idea what we're talking yeah, about. That's okay. Let's keep going. <laughs> where I just saw that if there were opportunities elsewhere, I was willing to do whatever it took to get those opportunities. So I was a I was into that Chex TV job for about a year and there was an open casting call it much more music. And I called into work sick so I could take the train into Toronto, go to this open casting call, just thinking like, you know, news reporting was great, but I didn't want to do news reporting for the rest of my life. I was 22 years old at the time and I wanted to do something that maybe would help to showcase my personality a little bit more cuz I wanted to be a TV host and I didn't want to be a news reporter, but I saw that being a news reporter was a foot in the door to learn the ropes of broadcasting. And I learned them all. Like I was writing, shooting, reporting, and editing all of my own stories. So I like learned a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. Went to this open casting call, long story short, I'm filling out like the paperwork and the security guy comes up to me, pulls me out of the crowd. And he's like, I need to talk to you. And I'm like, oh my God, what did I do? And he's like, no, nah, don't worry. They like wanna see the people they're interested in first before getting to everybody else. And I was like, wow. That was a huge boost of confidence. And I went in, got a call back. I had another audition with them. It didn't end up going anywhere, but it built this confidence in me that someone in that much music building, much more music building was interested in me. And I'm like, well, some, you know, this is, this is headed in the right direction. Handful of months later, there was an opening for a show called 969 on Razor, which was a sister station of much more music, much music, but based in Vancouver. So I'm like, I already have a leg up. I kind of already know this is what they're looking for. If there's somehow that I could even just like get in front of them, I would I'll do whatever I can to take this opportunity. So I sent in my stuff, didn't hear back from them, but I knew the name of the person that was doing the casting because it was on the application. So I randomly called up the TV station in Vancouver and I said, oh, hey there, I sent in my stuff. Um, can I speak to the name? Can I speak to Catherine were Peterson? You, were you were you nervous to do this? No, I was. I was just like, it was just like I'm uh, going to take a chance. A shot. <laughs> like, the, what's the worst that could happen? The worst that they, could they happen go. Is, this guy's bugging me again. He's blacklisted. <laughs> right. No, it that could doesn't just, happen. They could just be like, uh, "Hey, stop bothering us," or like maybe they just don't answer. I ended up leaving a voicemail. She ended up emailing me back and was like, "Hey, we're still looking at some stuff, but you know, we'll be in touch." In the email signature was her direct phone number, so I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be calling her in a few days." And sure enough, I called her at her office line. She picked up. We chatted for like two minutes, and I said, "Well, I'm actually gonna be in Vancouver next Thursday. I'd love to come and talk to you about the job." And she's like, "Well, if you're gonna be in you, town, hold on. Were you online. supposed to be in Vancouver? No, of course I was." No? <laughs> Totally. So if she lie. said, let's meet, you were going to fly to Vancouver just to take the meeting? And that's exactly what I did. Really? She said, well, if you're going to be here, sure, come on by. And I hung up the phone. My dad at the time, he's now retired, but he was working for Lufthansa, the German airline. And I was like, I hung up the phone. I'll never forget. I hung up the phone and I, was, and I yelled downstairs from my bedroom. I'm like, dad, I need to fly to Vancouver. <laughs> and we like set this up and I flew to Vancouver and Five minutes in, she was talking about the salary for the job. And like, how, how old are whole, you? Like 23, 24, 25? 23, yeah. And I think the whole thing here was I made myself available. Like I, it's, it, they often talk about like right place, right time. I put myself in the right place at the right time. So I didn't even think in that moment of like, oh, Vancouver's pretty far away. Like that's 5,000 miles away. That's, you know, the other side of the country. I didn't think about it like that. I thought of this opportunity of like, it's right here. I would be silly to not take this. Yeah. I love that extra little push because 
everyone who is at a next level of success talks about the fact that at that level, like that level of effort you put in, that level of dedication, the level of follow-up, making it happen, it's not actually that competitive up there. Mm. Because most people tend to like do what they think, not, not necessarily the minimum, but what they think is the next level. Like, I'm going to send that email off. Well, everyone's sending that email off. Not very many people are then, you know, following up with the phone, following up with the conversation, <laughs> flying across the country to, to literally maybe get there and have nothing happen at all. And at that level, it's, it's actually not really that competitive because most people are crazy enough to do what you did. Well, look, if you're willing to do the things that other people aren't willing to do, then you're going to get the results that other people aren't going to get. And I just think for me, like there was really no downside. Like the only downside was I would spend two days in Vancouver. That was it. I wouldn't get the job and I would just keep looking. But at that point, I just knew that I wanted to do something more. And I felt like it was within my grasp. So I was like, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And I'll just keep asking and asking and asking and try to somehow get myself to a yes. And, and so you, you, I mean, that <laughs> I commend you for that because I am just learning, as, as I mentioned, you know, you said you were 23 at the time. I'm 39, you're 39 now. And I feel like I've just started taking those risks in the last year. <laughs> I like it. Okay, I'm, good. I'm, I'm so, you know, I we did this event with uh, Les Brown last year in oh, wow. Queens. So it's during the pandemic. New York is going absolutely bananas. And Les Brown is hosting this event. And and I, I flew down there um, just to help them out. Not quite sure where things would go on the agenda. <laughs> so it's like, I'm talking with their team. We're working with their team behind the scenes and helping to host and, and manage panels and all of that stuff. And uh, I turned to my wife and I was like, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't usually book tickets and plan these big trips just to show up and see like, let's see how it goes. Um, and then in September, I did that again for Tampa. Did that another event. Uh, and I, I think I've done six events that way in the last 12 months. Wow. And see, no, this is great. And I think well, that, and I'm just, I'm just this, learning this now though. Like it's, it's, but at the heart of this, it's like, it's about bringing value. And I think if you can bring value with you, Wherever you go with whatever you do, it's going to be rewarded. I hope so. I, it's, it's, the reason I'm sharing this is a bit uncomfortable. Is, it's because um, like the last event I flew out to was, I know you had Ed Milet on your podcast. Mm. I was at Milet's book launch, The Power oh, wow. of One More. And so I was backstage with him and with Dean Graziosi and, and um, like all of his friends that he had come out there. And uh, I helped with some stage management, you know, making sure people are where they need to be when they need to be there. I made Ed his coffee that morning. Uh, like I vacuumed the red carpet. And honestly, I kept flipping between, you know, I've, I've run an agency for a very long time. Um, I've run a multi-million dollar business. On one side, I'm busy going like, why am I getting coffee? For, like, it feels like an internship. Why mm. am I picking up garbage? Why am I vacuuming this carpet? Like, why am I doing this? And the other side, I'm going, I'm going these are some remarkable people. I get to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with, you know, like Ed was very busy that day, but we still spent 20 minutes just talking. Wow. And, uh, and his book is amazing and it wasn't recorded and it wasn't for anything else. It was just him and it was just me. And I had a whole bunch of those types of conversations. And yet um, I struggle to quantify how that somehow helps with the career, with the growth, with the plan, with these things. You've built your whole career off of having these types of conversations. And I imagine some have led to amazing things and others haven't. But how do you quantify, I suppose, or justify the time that you spend on these types of things or these types of conversations or connections when you maybe don't have a clear path as to how it's going to pay off in the future? I think it begins with how much value you can bring. And I don't think that you need to go into those situations going, what am I going to get out of this? It's more important to say, what can I bring to this situation? And the more value that you can bring, hopefully the more that you can get out of that. So I think it's important to just go, what am I stepping up to the plate with? Rather than the idea of like, you know, walking in with your hands out going, well, what are you going to give me? You know, I, I gave you my time. I paid for my own flight. I paid for my own, ho own hotel. What are you going to give me? And I don't, I don't think that's the right approach. I think the right approach is to go, here's what I can do. How can I even be of more service to you? And not everyone's going to pan out, but 
as you know, there's a lot of times where knowing this person leads to knowing this person, which leads to knowing this person, you know, and all along the way, it's kind of like this domino effect. Are you still taking those risks? Are you still trying those things today? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. It's not something that just 23-year-old Chris did? <laughs> no, it's it's literally how I got almost, I think it's how I got every job really I've ever had in this industry. And like, you know, long story short, that's how I got an internship at Chex TV that turned into a job. It was like, hey, it's, it's reading week next week. I'm going to be in town. Could I come by and talk to you about this job? Well, we don't usually do that, but if you're going to be in town, I, yeah, I guess I give you some time. That's, that's how I got that one. Even before that, I got my very first volunteer position in radio, basically the same way of like, Hey, I'm, I'm super passionate about this. Can I just come in and like help out, see how it's done in the real world? Sure. Come on by. I got my job in Florida in Miami. I was hosting this amazing show called Deco Drive. I was an entertainment reporter there. And I got that job because I happened to be on vacation at Disney World. And I knew <laughs> in that this, Orlando? In Orlando. And I knew that this job was possible. And I said to my agent, I said, if I could change my flight to fly out of Miami instead of Orlando, rent a car to drive down to Miami and call into work sick on Monday, do you think they could give me an audition? She's like, I don't know. We'll see. She came back to me. She's like, yeah, yeah, they can meet you at, I think it was like 7.30 PM. And I was like, done. I'll make it happen. And I literally did that. I called into work sick, changed my flight, rented a car. And I just wanted them to be able to see an audition of me in person rather than just like looking at my audition tape. And if they were you know, not going to go with me, at least they could like see me in person and go, yeah, not the right fit. But I wanted to at least stack the odds in my favor. So Yes, that's been an entire career. And a lot of them with like YouTube videos where it's like, this person said they would do an interview with me for my YouTube channel, but they're five and a half hours away. Man, do I really want to drive five and a half hours there, five and a half hours back for a 20 minute interview? Yes, I do. And I did that <laughs> a bunch of times too. Do, do I really want to? Yes, I will. <laughs> yeah. like, And, and is that of, just again about connection, about rapport, or is that the, is that standards you've set? Or is that about differentiating yourself from everyone else? I think it's just if I'm given the opportunity and someone is willing to bestow upon me their valuable time, because again, I think time's so valuable. Who am I to say no? So I think it just came down to like, this, this was a really big interview, the one I'm specifically referencing where I drove that far. Chris Jericho had just left WWE where he said he was going to live forever, or, uh, be forever and ended up signing with AEW, this new wrestling company, and he hadn't talked about it. And through a series of connections, I had his phone number. So I texted him and said, hey, I see you're going to be doing like this live event in this one city. Would you be open to doing an interview? And he's like, yeah, I, I have a bit of time before the event starts. If you go there, like, I'll make some time for you. And I'm like, okay. And I think there's a lot of people that would go, Ah, it's far. And, you know, they'd start coming up with the excuses. But yeah. for me, it was like, it's right there. It's right there in front of me. I I've got to take this opportunity. So that is so cool. Uh, with it. my booking agent, I have, um, there's a few names, but there's one in particular where uh, he's based out of the UK and we're on standing order that my whole team's on standing order where it's like, I don't care what day. I don't care what city. I don't care how long we get. Yes. If you get me in in person, you just tell me and I will be whatever. This is a comedian. So it's like wherever they are on their tour, whatever city they're in, whatever time of day, I will be there. You just tell me. <laughs> See, and then part of this, and I think this encapsulates a lot of what we're talking about here. There's something about feeling someone's energy in person and also being able to interact with them in person that like lights a fire in you. Like just being able to be in the same room oftentimes with people who are achieving the things that you want to achieve makes you go, it's possible for me too. So who do you look at? Who do you look up to and think it's, it's possible? You, you mentioned a few people who inspired you early along the way. Who do you look at today? I remember actually early on thinking that Joe Rogan was an amazing television host when he was hosting Fear Factor. I and remember I Joe him. Rogan from News Radio. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. I remember when he was hosting Fear Factor and I thought, man, I love how he just talks to the camera like the camera's his friend. Where, you know, that age of like game show hosting or reality show hosting, it was still very, I'll call it hosty. 
It was still very like, welcome back. Here's what we're doing today. And he just spoke so like, you know, casually. And I was like, that's, that's the style that I like. And there was also someone else at that time. There was a terrible show on, remember when Spike TV was called the new TNN? Do you remember that? No, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> So it was called the new... I remember when TNN was the Nashville network. Yes, and then it became the new TNN, and then it became Spike TV. Okay, cool. There was this terrible show on there called The Ultimate Revenge, and it was like the idea that like you got one over on me, so we were going to go on this show, and I was going to like basically punk you and get one over on you, get the ultimate revenge. The show was awful, but there was this host, and he was so charismatic, and he had this charisma that like leapt through the screen, and I would record the show on VHS because I thought that host was so engaging. And his name was Ryan Seacrest. And about, ah, a year, about a year later, he got a show called American Idol that changed American his Idol. life. Yeah, him and him and uh, the other guy who didn't Ryan Dunkelman. Who didn't make it past season one? Yeah, it's so funny though because on that first season, I remember watching that show, and and not liking Ryan Seacrest, mm. and actually liking the other guy because Ryan Seacrest was jumping off the stage and he was bigger than life and he was just like a lot of energy. Yeah. Um, but, but I think he, I think he, I, I think he's doing okay. He's found his stride. I'd say. <laughs> hey, yeah. Doing all right. But I just, I'm really inspired by what Joe Rogan's built and the fact that like, he's taken all the things that he's passionate about. You know, he's passionate about MMA. He's a commentator for UFC. He's passionate about comedy. You know, he's been doing stand-up comedy for 30 years. He's passionate about storytelling and, you know, and asking questions. And now he has the most popular podcast in the world. And that's really fascinating to me. And I think that the idea of like where content creation is headed, where it's like, take the things that you're interested in. And if you're interested in them and you're passionate about them, you know, it's 8 million people on this earth. There's going to be a lot of people that are probably also passionate about them too. Well, and so that got me wondering though, because I know that you you love wrestling. And I knew that before I heard you say it, only because when I was going through your YouTube feed, I'm like, there's a lot of wrestling people here. So, <laughs> so either you are into it or someone is paying you to have all these conversations. <laughs> but, you know, are you not worried about becoming like, like how do you mix those two worlds? Like eventually you're just going to become like the wrestling guy, won't you? I don't know. I, I feel like Joe Rogan's a great example of like, he's not just the UFC guy because he talks to so many other people. And I mean, in the course of this last month or handful of months, sure, I've talked to a lot of wrestlers because I, I, I am a big wrestling fan and I wanted to be a wrestler when I was growing up. But I'm also like really just interested in finding out like how did somebody get to the place where they're at right now? Mm. So in the past month or two, I've talked to comedians and actors and directors and writers, entrepreneurs, athletes, yeah, of course, yeah, a handful of wrestlers too. And the whole reason why the wrestling interviews I think do really well on my YouTube channel is because early on, I was interviewing a lot of people from all different walks of entertainment. And every once in a while, WWE would come to town and I would do an interview like you know, once or twice a year. And I think that they were so used to answering like the very standard questions that they would get when they would go to a town and someone wasn't really a big wrestling fan. I started asking questions like as a hardcore fan and being like, hey, I've always wondered about this thing that happened 15 years ago or like yeah, yeah. this thing that's happening now behind the scenes, like what's really going on there? And some of these interviews started immediately getting hundreds of thousands, some, some of the millions of views because I was approaching them as a fan rather than just like the local media guy who was going, we've got John Kenna in town here today. And uh, he's, he's a wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know that stuff's fake? <laughs> I, I was going to ask you about that, but then I heard you on another podcast give the best explanation ever. And so no, I'm just going to just... go ahead and just refer all of those other things that people have talked about. But, but I wanted to ask you, like, doesn't it feel like cheating sometimes? Because like you, I have um I was at an event where I had to speak about I had to host a panel on real estate investing with mm. people who have dedicated their entire lives to real estate investing. Yeah. And so I am busy learning about alternate investing strategies, uh US taxation for capital gains rollovers and like all of this stuff just because honestly, I don't know anything about this. Mm. But but to to host and be able to control a panel and, and moderate in a really effective way, I feel like I I got to know something about this. And then at times I come to play to, to the types of conversations where I'm a deep fan 
Sure. And it is such a pleasure, like you just mentioned. Like, it's so nice to connect with someone where I'm just a huge fan of theirs and what they've done or the industry or the history or all of those things. And this is a question for me now, not even for the audience. When I'm really deep into the things I'm a fan of, it feels like cheating because it's just so fun and easy. Do you think that it's fair for me to put the pressure on myself that I want to be just as good as the at every conversation as the deep fan ones? Or is it just reality that they're different? And I should actually embrace the things that I'm really a fan of and just go deeper in them as opposed to trying to go wider? I think it's important in every situation to know the audience. So if the audience is in the same shoes as you and they don't know a lot, then I think that you coming in as a moderator, not knowing a lot, is it's perfect. But if you're going in there and you know the audience has you know, a certain level of expertise here, you should at least try to get yourself up to that level. I do think, though, on the flip side, you do run the risk of being like too inside baseball when you're like the super fan of something. Like, you know, not only am I very passionate about pro wrestling, I'm also like really passionate about bass fishing. But if I were to like go into some conversation and I was like talking about the intricate details of like six pound fluorocarbon line and a quarter ounce tungsten drop shot weight with a one, you know, a, a circle hook, you'd be like, what are you talking about? So I think it's really important to like know your audience and understand like, are they going to know what these terms are? And if not, you know, maybe we could just simplify it a little bit. Hmm. I love that because it's always about the audience. But I, I often wonder um, whether your job is your job is to serve the audience, but you also want to respect the guest across from you. Yeah. So I always struggle with, and I've bounced back and forth on this. Like when I show up having done no research at all on a guest, yeah. Not only do I have a ton of fun, it's all like I'm just exploring it as we go. But I'm learning as the audience is learning, and it's it's amazing. But I feel like it's a bit disrespectful for the person across from me. Larry King never prepped for anything; he just showed up, and sometimes it showed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's that there's that famous clip with Jerry Seinfeld where like he pretty much insulted Jerry by being like, oh, you know, you stopped the show because the ratings were low, and he's like, Larry, what are you talking? Our ratings were the best they ever were. Like, yeah. I th- he's like, I'm making more money than anyone else. So, so yeah. you don't want you don't want what's that. the what's the deal with this question, Larry? <laughs> so. I feel like, I think that you should at least know bullet points if, if you want to go into it like completely blind, like with the Larry King approach. I think you would need, at least know, need to know like bullet points. Like if someone transitioned from, I'm just making this up by the way. If someone transitioned from like being a pro boxer to now being an actor because of like a, an injury in the ring that like caused them to, you know, I don't know, break their arm or go blind or something. You can't approach the conversation going, so, you know, what was it that uh, that made you you know get into acting? And they'd be like, what are you, "It's the thing that every it's the it's yeah. the thing everybody knows about me." What are you talking yeah. about? You, you, so you don't sit across from Britney Spears and then not bring up the legal battle she's been in for all these years, right? Movies. Or you know, sit across from O.J. Simpson and go, "When did what? the public opinion on you change?" Yeah, uh, O.J. Thanks thanks for coming on. Um, can I ask you a quick question? What's up with this glove thing? Like like right. everybody keeps talking about this glove, like. I'm right. too young to know what's going on. So fill me in on that. <laughs> so you don't I, want that. It, you don't want that. <laughs> if your approach is to go in, I would I would never recommend someone to go in blind. But if your approach is to go in like kind of blind, I would at least ask like a friend who's really knowledgeable. Let's say you're interviewing a, a football player. Interview your friend who's a big football fan and go, all right, what are five things I need to know about this guy named Tom Brady? You know, and like, don't risk looking stupid when you're like, so like, you know, you live in Florida now. That's great. I, I remember you used to like Wrangler jeans. I saw a lot of commercials <laughs> about that. What's going on with the jeans? Okay, so so that's on one end of the spectrum. But on the other end, as you mentioned, uh, when you're geeking out, when you do too much research, like even, even preparing for this, I wanted to know enough. But the more that I learned of you, not only the more did I like, uh, but but it's like almost like you were answering the questions that I would have asked. So now I'm challenged to either ask questions I already know the answers to, which is cool. It's my job, maybe, or uh, to ask them in a way that is maybe slightly different than you've already previously answered. But but it almost like removes a little bit of the magic or mystery when you do know a lot about the other person. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that I'm sure you've fallen into this as well, but there's often times when you're asking a question, knowing kind of what the answer is going to be, or you're you're leading them in a direction, kind of like, instead of asking this question straight up, we can kind of like get 
there. But I think that if you're going to do that, then I think you should have like a, it should be like a one, two punch of like, all right, I'm going to get you there. But once we've got there, it's because I want to ask you this question. Hmm. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Master class with, with Chris. <laughs> Let's let's change gears a little bit if we can. So I have to imagine as you've progressed through your career, you've you've been able to speak to some of the most again remarkable people. What are some of the things that that those of us who don't do your job would be really surprised by? You know, whether that's how different people might be off camera versus on camera, either pro or con, or just kind of like really what goes into into being able to to do what you do. One of the biggest things is realizing that the energy that you bring to a room and the energy that you bring to a situation is oftentimes reciprocated back to you for better or for worse. And a lot of these times when you're doing these interviews that are, you know, three, four, five minutes, you're sitting in like a hallway of a hotel and you're like fifth in line to do this interview. So there's four hosts or four reporters in front of you. They're going in and you're in this hall and you're kind of like talking very quietly because the interview is happening right in front of you. And I think that if you bring that energy from the hallway with you into the room, your interview can often fall flat. So I learned pretty early on, like to really, you know, bring the, the most amount of energy you can, whether it's in a Zoom window like this, or it's physically walking into a room. And I think that that was a really big one. And that sometimes, and I'm sure you're aware of this, Mark, that sometimes the camera like deadens your excitement. Like sometimes you could feel like you were so excited and that went so well. And then you watch it back and you're like, Wow, I look really bored. Or I sound. Really <laughs> I I get that so much because when I'm talking, I'm like I got veins popping out of my heads. I'm so into this, and then when I'm listening, this is my voice. Right. And then we watch. We are you know we watch the footage back. And for all our listeners, I had like the most boring face in the world because I'm just listening. And sure. we watch the footage back, and I go to my team. I'm like, can you get something of me nodding or smiling <laughs> or something? Like I look so bored, but I'm just intently listening to what the guest is saying. Yeah. And I, I think that there's, there's a fine balance, right? Because you don't want to be like too far, too like too awkwardly excited. And at the same time, you don't want to be like, uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Cool. You know, you don't want to sound too bored. Because look, especially when it's a Zoom interview, there's already a bit of a clunkiness. Like it's cool that you and I are on the other side of the, well, we're in different countries right now as we're doing this, but like in completely different time zones, that's amazing. But there's still like this half second delay, as great as technology is, there's like half second delay that you need to like deal with to begin with. So I think it's it's important to know that what you bring is what you get out of it, I think. That is the greatest advice ever. Because um, I, I learned that I learned that a few years ago, but my wife, she's a personal trainer and she's a coach at, um, at one of these uh, group fitness studios. And so her job is to have people come in for an hour mm. and her job is to push them, to keep them on time, to tell them what's coming up next. It's like, it's a lot of fun. And sure. often uh, she's coaching on a Sunday morning. Now at like 7.15 on a Sunday morning, you're not going to get people who are like, let's face the day, right? And and so afterwards, sometimes she, she'd say, well, my second class had way more energy or this group was better. And I kind of went, listen, it's, it's your fault. Like, I, I don't want to be rude or anything, but like, you, it's your job to bring the energy. That is what you are paid for. And I learned that in pitching business, in sales, in presentations, on stage. Like, like it's one thing to have the audience give you some energy yeah. or the people you're working with give you some energy, but it's our job. It's your job in order to, to get into the zone and to bring it and, and obviously not go so high, like read the room, right? I think, <laughs> I think you got to read the room, but it's your job to bring the energy to whatever situation you're in. And then people will feed off that. And then it's just a cycle that kind of takes off from there. Right. I, I also think it's important to take big swings and take big chances. Like if it doesn't, Happen, like if it doesn't go the way that you want it to go, if you ask a question and it doesn't go the way you want it to go, or you like kind of push the envelope a little bit and it, it, it doesn't, you know, what does happen. that mean? Push the like, like ask like something that might make them uncomfortable or, or, silly, or just like or ask like a big ask, like something with that might be like, I'll give you a great example. My friend Jake Hamilton that I was referencing earlier, if you watch his demo reel, he got to dance with Angelina Jolie during this like one interview. He it was eating like melted chocolate bars in this hilarious moment with Paul Rudd. And then he's with Morgan Freeman and he goes, 
look, you know, you're known for your voice. I always thought if I ever sat down across from you, I always wanted to ask if you could record my eulogy and we'll have it played back at my funeral one day. <laughs> hands so him a piece bizarre. of paper. I love it. But, you know, if so he hands him a piece of paper. Morgan Freeman looks at it. Jake Hamilton was one badass dude. And he reads this like hilarious eulogy. And I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. But on the flip side, if it didn't work and Morgan Freeman goes, no, this is stupid. Oh, I, I had to ask, you know, but th thank you for entertaining my question. Appreciate it. And then, you know, you cut it out. And the only people that ever know about it is you, Morgan Freeman and the camera operators, and that's it. So I think it's important sometimes to take some big swings. Like I was interviewing Gerard Butler for, uh, I think it was London Has Fallen, which is a big action movie. And I was asking him about a movie punch. And he's like, I, I swear to you, my best movie punch is in this film. And I go, well, like, what's the secret to it? Can, can you do one? He's like, like right here. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he goes, all right, well, okay. Sit up on your chair a little bit. I'm like, okay. So I sat forward a little bit. He goes, all right, I'm going to come in like this. I'm going to be like a, you know, about two feet away from your face. But when I come in like this, you want your head to go. I'm like, okay, great. And then boom, in the moment we like did this movie punch that I, I just was like, well, if, if I don't ask, this is the big thing. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. How do you know in, in your type of job, like most entrepreneurs, like most creators, how do you know whether you're doing the right thing or not? Mm. Like, like, how do you know? Cool. Take the big swings and have fun and ask the challenging questions and get the soundbite that no one else is getting. And if you get invited back, then I guess people don't hate you. And if people are watching your stuff, I guess you're doing a good job. But, but those are like such big, like such high indicators. They're in the clouds. It doesn't tell you whether the, the person who's booking you thinks you're an asshole or not, or the person sitting across from you secretly in their head is going, oh, this guy just walked in the room again. Okay, let's play ball. Like, and maybe none of that matters, but for some reason it feels like it, it matters to me. And, and, it, it, and maybe this is just something that holds me back. I think really at the end of the day, you can only find out about that in hindsight. You know, you got to trust your gut. And this isn't just interviewing advice. I think this is just life advice or business advice. You've got to trust your gut and go with your gut. And if your gut's saying, it's a pretty good idea, then I think that you go with it. And if it doesn't work out, I think that you figure that out later on. But I think you commit to it and you go with it and you just figure it out as you're going. But how do you know whether you're doing a good job or not? I think it's your gut, right? And I think a really so big you just one is, you just love your gut. <laughs> and I, I think another part of it is like the YouTube comments, love them or hate them, often will lean one way or another. And I think that if you put out, we'll, we'll use an interview as an example. You put out an interview, and a lot of the comments are saying a lot of the same thing positively. I think you go, all right, that was a good swing. I like that. If you put out that same thing, and a lot of the comments are saying something very similar that's negative, you go, huh, I thought this was good. I stand behind this. But if the general consensus is this wasn't a good idea, maybe I temper it for next time. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. Just the, the thoughts popped into my head. In terms of in terms of what yeah I was gonna say in terms of what what could have been the thing that we don't do next time okay so uh, Angelina Jolie um, I have brought whipped cream with me and no no, no. Uh, <laughs> so what what are some of the I guess the hardest lessons that you've had to learn along the way hmm that's a great question or if you're feeling really brave some of the biggest mistakes you've made I'm sure the biggest mistakes have led to the you know biggest lessons. I think the biggest lesson is really to go for it. And you need to just start whatever it happens to be. You know, since we're on a podcast right now, there's a lot of people out there that want to start a podcast. And I think it's important to just start. Like you have to start and there's never going to be a perfect moment. And you're never going to be 100% perfectly prepared for whatever it happens to be that's on the other side of this thing that you want to do. But I think you just have to start. You have to, you just have to go after it. And I think that that was a really big one for me is like, you can prepare as much as you want to prepare, but you're still never going to be prepared enough. And that, cause there's, there's no perfect level of that. So you just, you just got to go for it. And but, but what about when the excitement wears off and the big idea suddenly becomes much harder 
and the things you were counting on fall through. And the, the gap between your peak performance moments and that excitement becomes eight months in between one opportunity and the next. Like it, the, the reality of, of what you've done isn't just mountaintop to mountaintop. I mean, you're, it's, it's 2022. So what, you're 15, 16, 17 years into this career. I mean, it's not all going to be flying off to Paris hang out with movie stars all the time, right? <laughs> Yeah, but I think it's celebrating the little wins along the way. And I think that there's some big, as you called them, mountaintop moments. And you look at the name on the door that you're about to walk into to do an interview and it's Tom Cruise or The Rock or Meryl Streep. And you go, that's, that's a big one. This is awesome. And then maybe you're interviewing someone for a show that you're maybe not as excited about, or maybe you go a few weeks or months without something big. But I think you celebrate those little wins along the way. And I'm a big proponent of gratitude. And I wake up every day, I say out loud three things that I'm grateful for. I do it before I go to bed as well. And I think it's important to like, be grateful for the opportunities you have, whether that's in your business or whether that's in your personal life, be grateful for the opportunities you have. And then ask yourself, what can I do with the opportunities I have in front of me right now? Because what you did on that mountaintop a month ago or six months ago is not today. Maybe it's helped to inform what you're doing today, but it's not today. So I think it's important to take what you have in front of you and run with that rather than thinking about the things that you used to do. <laughs> what were three things you were grateful for this morning? Oh, I love this. This is so good. I'm grateful for my health and the health of all the people that are closest to me. I'm grateful for family and the people that I call family, but also like, you know, people that aren't necessarily like blood relatives. I'm just grateful for like really good people in my life and grateful for opportunity. Like we live in a time right now where we have a supercomputer in our pocket and you can call someone on the other side of the planet and look at their face. Like we have so many amazing opportunities that are around us all the time. I'm, I'm so grateful for that. You seem like a pretty optimistic dude. Are you, do you naturally lean like on the optimistic side of things? I just think it's better than the opposite, right? <laughs> it's I better than it's, the cold, cynical, depressed. Right. If these are the two options, I think I'd rather choose this one because there really is the best in every situation. And I think that it's important to focus on that because you have a choice in every moment to focus on what you have or what you don't have, what's good or what, you know, it's not going well. And I, I would just much rather focus on the good things. And what would you... If I were setting out to replicate what you've done, what would be the, the two or three really key takeaways where you'd say, Mark, listen, man, don't, don't, don't be an idiot like me. Don't make the same mistake. Don't I do made. it. Mark, just, what just, are you no, doing? no, no, don't say don't do it. No, you're going to do this. You're built for this, but just don't make the mistakes I made. Please avoid one, two, and three. What would those be? The three mistakes you should avoid? Yeah, just, just help me shortcut all of the yeah, hard things I you think have to learn. I love the idea of reverse engineering and like finding somebody who's doing the thing that you want to do and reverse engineering it back to you. I think don't compare. Like you're you're not that other person or those other people that you look up to. And while you can take uh, advice from them and you can look at their career and take little nuggets from them, I think comparison truly is the thief of joy. I'm sure Abraham Lincoln said that, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Abe, Abe does say most of the things. He, he says he says all of the things on the internet. Okay, but so you're I sitting think... down with George, right? George Strabanopoulos, uh, Canadian legend. You referenced him earlier. You looked up to him. Uh, you know, you're sitting down with him and you're saying, listen, man, three pieces of advice for my career. He would give you, he would give you three things, even though you're not comparing. And I think that oftentimes, like when you ask for like three pieces of advice, five pieces of advice or whatever, I think a lot of times just as humans, we're really just looking for like the one nugget we can go, ah, oh, I never thought about it like that. Or they tell, someone tells a great story and you go, oh, that story is really going to inform a lot of the rest of my life. So I think uh, if we're going here with mistakes, a big one was I moved my entire life to Vancouver, take a huge chance was hosting this amazing show on MTV2 Canada. The show ended up getting canceled after a year. When the CTV and Chum merger happened, uh, they had to find some way to make some budget cuts. And our show was one of those. And I think a big mistake for me was trying to find something that equally replaced that moment that I had, that opportunity that I had, instead of striving forward to what the next thing was, which if I'm being completely honest with you, Mark, I was unemployed for seven months after that happened. And I was searching for literally anything at that point. 
because I just wanted another job on television. And I think that I was trying to go, well, I did this thing. I see my identity as this one thing. I need this thing again, not realizing there were other opportunities that may have been better suited for me out there. So it that was- is, Hold on, that is remarkable. I, I, don't think I've, I don't think I've heard anyone articulate it quite like that. This idea that you could have a high moment and when it's gone, focus so much on trying to replace the magic of what was as opposed mm. to looking for the next thing. And, and I can, I, <laughs> you're blowing my mind right now because I'm just seeing this in terms of relationships, you know, the relationship that goes south and you just want to, the next one to be just as good or better and so similar and, and you close off the opportunity for what's different or what's new. I don't think I've ever heard anyone speak to this. Before. And that's the way that you just compared it right now to a relationship, I think is perfect because a lot of us have had those relationships where you weren't ready for them to end and you feel like the rug got pulled out from underneath you and you, you were kind of left there going, but wait, uh, what just happened? And that's what happened with that job. And I was going, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to say goodbye and close that chapter of my life. And it got closed for me. And I was trying so hard to replicate that thing. And I'm speaking here about the job, but this is certainly applicable to, I think, relationships whether that's a friendship or a romantic relationship, I think that you go, ah, oh, that person's not quite, they don't do this exact thing that the other person did. So that's yeah, not the right fit. I'm going to move on from there. That was a really big lesson to learn. I don't know. I, I almost, I, I feel um, inspired by that thought that, and because I can see it in myself now. And um, again, I've never, I've never thought of it like this mm. before the fact that I don't know if I've thought about it this way either and you yeah, know no the reason I'm struggling for words right now is because this is um th this is a profound moment this is this is an amazing lesson you've just given me I I had I had an agency that I built into a multi-million dollar agency and COVID knocked the shit out of us you know mm -hmm. much smaller um totally different direction and while I've wanted while we've shed a lot of the things that didn't work I'm still kind of like holding on to the things that did and somehow mm -hmm. hoping like, well, well, can I get it back? And what if I can't get it back? And what does that say about me? And I've, I've looked at other people. Um, you know, some, uh, there's an amazing leader I look up to I look, who, who got a television show that only ran for six months and then was canceled. And, and I put myself in their shoes and I think, oh gosh, what if they can't get that next show or that next thing? Not, not even realizing that by focusing on the thing that you had that just didn't work. Yeah. You're closing yourself off to all the things that may come along that you never saw coming that may work. I mean, I talked about this with The Rock. And when you think about The <laughs> way Rock... Way to name drop, by the way. <laughs> it, so there's this, there's this up and coming actor. He used to be a wrestler. There's this guy that you may have heard of. <laughs> His whole goal was to play in the NFL. And that was like where, where his entire life was headed. His one sole goal was to play in the NFL, you know, and he played college ball at Miami university, of Miami did really well, played with some huge people there like Warren Sapp and uh, Ray Lewis. Then he went to the CFL and got cut from the Calgary Stampeders. And that was the end of his football career. And I think for a lot of other people, that would also be the end of their story. I, you know, I got a scholarship to play football, got cut from the CFL. Now I'm doing this thing. The rock instead took that same passion, that same drive, directed it a little bit this way, turned a little bit, pivoted, put into pro wrestling. Then when he reached the mountaintop in pro wrestling and did everything he wanted to do in pro wrestling, he pivoted again. And now he's the giant star that he is in, the, in Hollywood. And I asked him, I said, if you could change anything to actually live the dream that you had to play in the NFL, would you change anything? And he told me something that was so profound. He said that sometimes the best things in life are the things that don't happen. And it's so true. Sometimes you think your life needs to go this certain way. I'll do this, then I'll do this, and then this thing will happen. And sometimes life throws you a curveball. And you can either go, well, that thing didn't happen. That's the end of it. Or you can go, huh, well, maybe I can take this other opportunity and life will be even better on this path. And that's what happened with The Rock. Reminds me of Garth Brooks's Unanswered Prayers. That's right. It's very it's a song that just, yeah. that just <laughs> reminds me of growing up in the 90s. Uh, Last question for you, Chris. I, I so appreciate your time. But as we wrap up, I, I ask everyone this final question because I always find it so intriguing. For you, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Well, first of all, 
Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so glad that we can connect this Durham region. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> Durham region people. What are we, Durham regionites? <laughs> I, I don't know. Trontonians, let's just go ahead and pretend sure. that we're from the big city. <laughs> well, I mean, look, we're all Canadian here. So we'll just, you know, I think when what's funny when we see someone who's Canadian, that's uh, like Justin Bieber, or, uh, uh, Pamela Anderson or Alex Trebek or any of these people, you're just like, ah, oh, one of us. Yes. Yeah. Jim Carrey. Like we like Jim to Clark, claim Barry all of lady. them, but Good everybody night, big leaves Canada. <laughs> so. For for me, it, it comes down to just a simple thought and a simple question. It's like, am I excited for what I'm going to do today? And then at the end of the day, am I proud of what I've done? And I think that that's, that's my barometer for success every single day. I, I want to be pumped every single day. And this all stemmed from when I was in college, I was about to graduate at the end of that year. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're having so much fun here in college. But when we graduate, we have to work for the rest of our lives. And in that exact moment, I realized I didn't want to have a job that I hated. I want to have a job that I at least could go to and be excited about. And that's still what it is for me every single day. It's just like, I want to be pumped. I want to like get out of bed and be like, yes, we are doing it again today. Mm -hmm.